Hey everyone, so this video is um, a follow-up of sorts to our conversation on Wednesday, April 8th, where we were talking about poetic forms um, and why you might choose to write in form. Um, and so this video is a presentation, an overview of some of the most common and canonical traditional forms that you might encounter in your reading and your writing, um, an overview of some of their of their rules, some of the history, um, etc, which should hopefully give some context um, for our conversation and give you some ideas about forms that you might want to try. Um, so on the left here, of course, is our, our guy William Shakespeare. Um, and then on the on the right is contemporary writer Marilyn Nelson, um, whose work we'll talk about again in a little bit. So any conversation about form in the context of English language poetry probably makes sense to start by talking about the sonnet. So the sonnet is as you know, one of the oldest, stricting and strictest, and most enduring poetic forms. Um, uh, it's sort of like the industry gold standard of form in English language poetry. It comes from the Italian word sonetto, meaning little sound or song. Um, emphasis, I think, on the little. Emerged in Italy in the 13th century, um, made famous by this guy Francesco Petrarca. And so when we talk about the Petrarcan sonnet, that's who we are referencing. Um, Sir Thomas Wyatt brought it to England, where it was taken up by Shakespeare and became the sonnet that is most kind of um, popular, known, and loved. Basic rules of the sonnet, which we have talked about before, but we'll go over here. 14 lines. Iambic pentameter, um, so on the right here, uh, in case it's helpful, is another example. Two households, both alike in dignity. Uh, rhyme scheme varies depending on which kind of sonnet you are writing. And then possibly the most important rule of the sonnet is that it has a volta or a turn. The reason I think that the volta is so important um, is is because of, of this. Um, this quote from, from Rachel Rich Richardson from um, this essay that I think is great, uh, which goes, the sonnet is also thought of as the first lyric of self-consciousness or of the self in conflict, according to Paul Oppenheimer in this book. As such, the form consists of two parts, often called the proposition and the resolution. Dividing them is the volta or turn. Thus a problem or question is often presented in the first section of the sonnet, and then via the pivot made by the turn, resolved or given a new perspective in the second. So um, because the sonnet is this um, little room, this little song of um, inner conflict, that's the reason that the volta is so kind of like instrumental in, in the form. So uh, here's Petrarca on the left, doing his thing. Um, the Petrarchan sonnet, the older version of the sonnet, the original sonnet, is two stanzas, an eight-line stanza, or an octave, and a six-line stanza, also called a sestet. And the volta comes at the beginning of the sestet, right? So a little bit more than halfway through. So the first part of it, the rhyme scheme is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. And then the second part of it switches up that rhyme scheme and goes C, D, E, C, D, E, right? So... As an example of, so even though the, the Petrarchan sonnet is the older, um, older f like form of the sonnet, uh, it is one that still persists. So here is Edna St. Vincent Millay, who is a, um, was a poet who was writing like in the 30s. Um, she was one of the first women to ever win the Pulitzer Prize um, in literature. So um, I'll just read this one so you can hear, because um, we've read a lot of Shakespearean sonnets, but so that you can hear the kind of like, uh, the difference in the rhyme scheme and how it makes it sound. So, what lips my lips have kissed and where and why I have forgotten and what arms have lain under my head till morning. But the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh upon the glass and listen for a reply. And in my heart there stirs a quiet pain for unremembered lads that not again will turn to me at midnight with a cry. Thus in the winter stands the lonely tree, nor knows what birds have vanished one by one, yet knows its boughs more silent than before. I cannot say what loves have come and gone. I only know that summer sang in me a little while, that in me sings no more. So you can hear, really hear the difference between the rhyme scheme in the second part and the, and the first part, right? And that this turn happens with, the, with this word thus. Right? So... The Shakespearean sonnets, the more like 
popular known kind uh, today, but it's three quatrains, four line stanzas. Those are four line stanzas. And then a couplet, a rhyming couplet at the end to kind of like, you know, clinch it all shut. So the rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, right at the end. Um, My Mistress's Eyes are Nothing Like the Sun, or Sonnet 130 is a really classical example and and, um, one that you might know that maybe we've talked about, I think, in class. Um, And then here's the thing about the switch in form from the Petrarchan to the Shakespearean sonnet or from the Italian to the English. That's that change in form also coincides with a change in in conventions of content too, right? So the thing is that the Italian sonnet um, was often a Uh, not just about a self in conflict, but particularly um, about idealized and unattainable love, like a sort of like godlike love. Um, And then when it came over to England um, and Shakespeare innovated and and changed changed it um, to this new form, um, he also made an innovation on the conventions of content, right? So um, this poem is not about idealized love. In fact, it's about like a sort of imperfect and actual love that, um, that you know, despite it all, um, it, he says, and yet by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare, right? So he's turning the convention on his head. I'll, I just mentioned that to say that, um, again, shifts in, in form, not just like individually, but throughout history, aligned with shifts in content as well. There are lots of variations on the sonnet. So you might hear about Miltonian sonnets or Spenserian sonnets. Um, those have different rhyme schemes and different conventions. Um, one form or variation that um, is, I find really interesting is the crown of sonnets. So this is 15 sonnets that that interlink in um, in this particular way. So the way that it does that is that the last line of sonnet one, the first sonnet in the sequence, beco- becomes repeated and then becomes the first line of sonnet two and so on. And so all of these are, are linked, um, which makes editing, by the way, very hard. And then the final sonnet is made up of all, so that's 14 of them. And the final sonnet is made up of all of the lines that have repeated so far. So it's a very... Um, it's a kind of a huge undertaking. Um, there have, are a few people who have done it to really um, incredible effect. So Marilyn Nelson, who was on that first slide, uh, wrote a crown of sonnets, which she called A Wreath for em- Emmett Till, um, which you see here on the, on the left, um, which is um, sort of canonical at this point. Um, and then one innovation or intervention that I find um, that has been interesting in the last few years has been this concept of American sonnets, first sort of popularized in, uh, in some small circles by Wanda Coleman. And then Terence Hayes, um, maybe two years ago, published this book called American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin, where every poem um, had the same title. Um, and it, they were all 14-line sonnet-ish things, right? Um, <clears throat> so... The American sonnet, um, as as these poets have coined it, um, maintains 14 lines. And other than that, there's not that much um, uh, that is sort of uh, preserved in, from the original rules. So if you, like, I'll just go to the end here. Love trumps power or blood to trump power. Beauty trumps power or blood to trump power. Justice trumps power or blood to trump power. The names alive are like the names in the graves. So these lines are not iambic. They're not 10 syllables for the most part. Um, A lot of liberties are taken within uh, the line for syntax, etc. So, um, but the thing is that when, you know, when, because of the place that the sonnet holds in English poetry, if something is 14 lines, um, most critics will look at it and in the context of it being a sonnet. Um, this is sort of what I mean when I say that when you write in form, you're also writing in conversation with a history that, um, that, that uh, came before you. Lyrie Van Cleef Stefanen in her poem uh, called The Bop, The North Star, there's a, there's a section in it where she's talking about teaching poetry in a prison and she says, the sonnet's a cell now trying to escape. 
um, going back to the the sort of like what um, what the sort of restrictiveness of a form, what kind of moves that might invite. Speaking of very restrictive forms, um, another one uh, which I mentioned before is the sestina. The sestina is um, a very complex form, French in origin, that involves six words that repeat over and over again throughout the poem. So you've got to choose those six words pretty carefully. So um, they each stanza, each line ends with one of these six words, and then the words repeat in a very particular pattern, um, this sort of like circling pattern, um, six stanzas where you have to follow this exact uh, uh, pattern, and then um, the last stanza is a tercet or a three-line stanza, and then, but you have to include all six words in that, um, in that final stanza. So here's an example of a kind of a bizarre one called Farm Implements of Rutabagas in a Landscape by uh, the poet John Ashbery, who's not known as a poet that's easy to understand. So um, you can see on the right here, we, you can see thunder, apartment, country, pleasant, scratched, spinach, and then it repeats spinach, thunder, scratched, apartment, pleasant, country, country, spinach, pleasant, and so on, right? So um, just listen to this first stanza. The first of the undecoded messages read, Popeye sits in thunder, unthought of. From that shoebox of an apartment, from livid curtains hue, a tangram emerges, a country. Meanwhile, the sea hag was relaxing on a green couch. How pleasant to spend one's vacation in La Casa de Popeye. She scratched her ch cleft chin's solitary hair. She remembered spinach and was going to ask Wimpy if he had bought any spinach. And so on, right? Um, so not all Cestinas sound um, as... Uh, sort of strange as this one, but um, but all sestinas are very complex in their structure. Villanelles. So um, the villanelle is another French form um, that also uh, includes not just a rhyme scheme, but repetition. Um, it's five three-line stanzas or tercets. Um, and then the lines one and three, the first and third lines of that first stanza repeat to kind of fo form a refrain that, that repeats um, throughout the rest of the poem. Um, uh, and then those, th those um, form the final couplet. Uh, there's also uh, the, other, the other lines that don't repeat uh, rhyme as well here. Let me just show you what I mean by all of this. So um, do not go gentle into that gold. Good night is by Dylan Thomas is probably the most famous villanelle that you might have heard before so here uh yeah i'll just read a little bit of it do not go gentle into that gold night old age should burn and rave at close of day rage rage against the dying of the light and then so now the first and third lines are going to repeat in the in the subsequent stanzas so though wise men at their end no dark is right because their words have forked no lightning they do not go gentle into that good night Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So you see how um, those two lines uh, go back and forth to kind of form this refrain. And it continues on until the end when um, do not go gentle into that good night and rage, rage against the dying of the light um, uh, form the final couplet. Uh, okay, uh, the pantoum is one that we looked at in your reading packet with the Natalie Diaz poem. Um, like I said before, it was, it was uh, it's uh, most, I think in many contexts, most known as kind of a French European form, but it's actually Malaysian in origin. It was used for Malaysian folk and children's poems, um, adapted by French poets in the 1800s at a time when um, European powers were colonizing much of the global South. It's made up of quatrains, and then this one, um, it's sort of a, a, a braided form. So the lines two and four of the first line repeat in the following to become lines one and three. So I'll show you just what that looks like. So um, he sat cross-legged weeping on the steps when mom unlocked and opened the front door. Oh God, he said, oh God, he wants to kill me, mom. So now two and four are going to repeat here. When mom unlocked and opened the front door, at 3 a.m. she was in her nightgown. Dad was asleep. He wants to kill me, he told her, looking over the shoulder. So you see how two and four become one and three. And then these, these new lines that appeared in this one then become the repeated lines in the next one. So it's sort of like um, a like a two steps forward, one step back kind of motion that is the effect of the pantoum. Um, yeah, and because every line will 
be said twice, be written twice. You really have to choose those carefully. And the challenge, I think, is often to make it sound new or give new perspective to to those lines as often as you can. So that's an interesting challenge, I think. Um, okay, let's move. Keep moving in um, the direction of poetic forms with origins outside of Europe. So um, the haiku and then uh, its variants, um, which include the tanka and the renga, um, are some of the most, I would say, like the, the, the most foundational kind of like base of what we know as uh, of Japanese poetry, um, right? So Japanese poetry is organized around on, which is comparable to syllables, but not exactly like syllables, right? So, um, but for the purposes of our conversation, we can call them syllables. The haiku um, was originally part of a form called the renga, which emerged in Japan around the 7th century as a long collaborative poem, which means that people would get together and each write a verse of this poem. Um, and usually it was a hundred verses uh, altogether, or there are variants too. But the first verse would be five, five, seven, five. So five syllables, five on, seven on, five on, right? And then the next one would be seven, seven. And then the third, five, seven, five, seven, seven, and on and on and on. Um, And then the interesting thing about renga when you have, when you're writing in this form is because it's collaborative, you, each verse that you write has to both close the previous thought um, and then open a new thought for the next person to take up. The first verse of the renga, which was at that point known as the hokku, began to emerge as its own standalone form in the 1600s, um, around the time of um, Matsuo Basho, who is kind of considered the master of this form. And um, and then at, at, so at some point later, it became known as the haiku, renamed uh, there. So uh, the rules of the haiku, which you are probably familiar with, but at least the first one is um, 17 on, right? 17 syllables, 575, five, like that first verse. Um, another, two other rules that are a little bit less known commonly are um, kiru, which it means cutting and is usually translated actually as juxtaposition, although it actually relies in Japanese poetry on a grammatical form called kireji or cutting word that doesn't actually have an equivalent in English. And so it's a little bit hard to translate this, but um, the way that people do it is by talking about juxtaposition. And then um, the haiku, the final rule of it is that it, it that the haiku has a seasonal reference. And um, in the past or more traditionally the seasonal reference was taken from a formalized set of like it was made in reference to a very formalized set of seasonal references but um more commonly now it's just sort of any seasonal reference and people interpret that pretty broadly one of the variations of the haiku which i think has been um finding some ways into contemporary american poetry and in interesting ways recently um is the haibun which is um a long prose poem which has a, a haiku at the end so this is a traditional japanese form that builds on the that base of the haiku that um people have been experimenting with recently this is a poem by amy nizuku matatel um so this, as you can see, there's this long, there's this prose block. To everything, there's a season of parrots. And instead of feathers, we search the sky for meteors on our last night. Salamanders use the stars to find their way home. Who knew they could see that far? Fix the tiny beads of their eyes on distant arrangements of light so as to return to wet and wild nests. Um, and so on. I won't read the whole thing. But then at the end, um, it this, this um, prose poem kind of clicks shut into this haiku at the end. It says, the cool night before star showers, so sticky, so warm, so full of light. Um, I think it's a really interesting form that I would encourage you to experiment with. Um, let's talk about the ghazal. Um, so the ghazal is uh, uh, one of the most, throughout the world, one of the most popular forms of, of poetry and song. Um, it was originally a form 
in Arabic poetry, um, often dealing with loss and romantic love. This form is taken up by medieval Persian poets and particularly under the influence of Sufi mystic poets spread from there um, throughout Turkey and South Asia, where it remains a very popular form of um, not just poetry, but music today. Uh, on the left here is the poet Amir Khusro, who is credited with bringing the ghazal to, um, to Urdu language poetry. So the form of the ghazal, the rules, um, it's made up of couplets. And the thing about the couplets is that each one should stand on its own. Like each verse should kind of like be able to exist on its own as its own poem. Each couple, that's a rule also that's kind of broken um, very often in contemporary ghazals, actually, in English at least. Each couplet ends on the same word or phrase. So the, uh, it ends on a word or phrase that repeats. Um, and then that is... Uh, that word or phrase is also preceded by a, a rhyming word. And then the last rule is that the final couplet of the ghazal should include the poet's name. So you're supposed to sort of like sign your work here. Agha Shahid Ali is um, uh, a poet who, or was a poet who um, uh, really popularized the ghazal in English language poetry. Um, yeah, so this is just the, the first few couplets of his poem tonight. So you can see that the repeating word is tonight, and then um, the word that that precedes it, that rhymes, is is um, expel or is this L sound. So, so um, I'll read these first few stanzas and listen to how each one can kind of, as I said, stand on its own as its own little um, mini poem. Where are you now? Who lies beneath your spell tonight? Whom else from rapture's road will you expel tonight? Those fabrics of cashmere to make me beautiful, trinket to gem, me to adorn, how tell tonight? I beg for haven, prisons let open your gates, a refugee from belief seeks a cell tonight. God's vintage loneliness has turned to vinegar, all the archangels, their wings frozen, fell tonight. Um, and it goes on like that. <clears throat> the Hazel is one, I think, that um, has been particularly um, taken up by um, minoritarian poets, poets of color and other marginalized voices, um, especially folks who are looking for a, uh, a form with a long tradition that had origins outside of um, Europe and the English speaking world. So here's hip hop puzzle, um, or the first few stanzas of it by the poet Patricia Smith, who is really um, uh, a mainstay and a champion of of, um, of poets of color writing today, especially younger folks. So um, this is just a very brief flyover of the many poetic traditions um, that have long histories outside of, of the English speaking world, right? So um, as just like you know, a few others that are actually really like not um, not popular in in English. There's the Korean shijo. There's the Burmese climbing verse. There's a the Vietnamese lukbat, which has a very complicated um, metrical form. There are Latin American forms like the decima and the rumba. Um, there are there's a, uh, many long traditions of praise poems throughout um, African African cultures, including, for example, the Yoruba oriki. So if you you are first of all this is a reminder that poetry as an oral tradition exists in all of our cultures and every culture throughout the world and if you're feeling um, like some poets have frustrated with um, with the poetic forms that you see over and over again I just encourage you to branch out and um, do research to find others um, especially others that that um, uh, that you have like a personal or historical relationship with. Before we end, I wanted to talk about, make sure to talk about two um, poetic forms from Greek classical traditions that exist today, um, although in really different forms from their from their origins. So um, the two that I want to talk about are the ode and the elegy because these show up a lot. So the ode, um, we've looked at a few things that call themselves odes that are odes. Um, 
Originally, it was an, uh, uh, in the ancient Greek tradition, it was a choral poem, um, uh, a part of lyric poetry. So lyric coming from the word lyre, right? This instrument, right? So um, it was originally performed with music for that reason um, at public events and usually to celebrate athletic achievements or like civic victories, right? So the Pindaric Ode, which is the the very original form had a very complex metrical structure and it consisted of three distinct parts there was a strophe which was in one kind of metered form the antistrophe which followed it in the same metered form like repeated that form again and then the epode so you can see that like the this structure exists um in many poems today, something like it, right? Like a move in one direction, a, a kind of mirroring move in another direction, and then some sort of like synthesis or turning out to the audience at the end. Um, but odes today don't often, don't always, and or often really follow either the structure and, and certainly not the original metric structure of, um, of the ancient Pindaric ode. Um, and poets also have really taken up the ode to as a way to praise all sorts of things from um, from great civic victories to things that seem intensely mundane. So here is one of my favorite examples is a poem by Jose Olivares called Ode to Cheese Fries. Golden goo of artificial delicious. What probably lines my stomach with sunlight grease for weeks after eating the yellow. So yellow it could only be manufactured. So what if it's fake? As much cheese content as apple Jolly Ranchers. And at the end he says, I want a joy so fake it stains my insides and never fades away. So um, in this way, poets have um, continued to write odes. Um, the Pablo Neruda was, I think, um, uh, can be credited with with starting this movement of poets writing odes to mundane things. Um, but what has been maintained throughout the the history of odes um, from that original uh, form is the tone and the spirit of the form rather than the its um its rules so that's something to consider as you're as you're um taking up forms the other one that i want to make sure to talk about is the elegy um which is which is sort of equally common in contemporary poetry this is a poem of mourning um it's also originally you know had a very complex metrical structure um metrical form and then the structure of the poem of the elegy traditionally has three parts. One, a lament for the person who um, has passed. Praise for that person's life as they lived. Um, and then finally, consolation for people who are uh, grieving that person's loss. This, um, while this structure, I think, off, you know, still kind of remains, though not, you know, um, in various like to various degrees um and elegies are of course very common and kind of have seeped into our culture uh, you know outside of just poems um but i think that one thing that's interesting about the elegy is that uh, that poets I recently especially have been taking up the kind of ethical problems of the elegy um in some really interesting ways so um, for example, Cameron Awkward Rich has this poet call, a poem called Anti-Elegy, which is a poem written on Trans Day of Remembrance, um, kind of problematizing the, the calls of the elegy and, and calling into question the, the ethics of, that, of the form itself. So this is just a section from, from this long poem, um, but I'll just read a little bit here. The trouble with elegy is that it asks the dead to live. It calls them back. And who am I to say rise, walk again among those who could not bear the sight of you, your body, your one good dress? And it goes on in this way. So um, as I said, when you take up a form that you're writing in, you're also um, putting yourself in conversation, not with not only with the, the history of people who have written that form, but also with the kind of like ethics and politics of the form itself. Just a quick um, word about the place of formalism in contemporary poetry. So I think that there's this idea that um, people used to write in form 
and now um, we've all been liberated by free verse, and so everybody writes in free verse now, and um, that's not exactly true, right? So, um, for example, in the 80s and 90s, there was this, uh, this uh, emergence of this movement called New Formalism that called itself New Formalism, um, where poets were saying, you know, we have, American poetry has suffered as a result of our move to free verse. And what we need now more than ever is a return to form. Um, they made some very interesting arguments and, and it kind of helped bring um, traditional form back into the mainstream of American poetry. Um, it, to me, somewhat more interestingly to me, um, it was this resurgence of interest in form, particularly by marginalized writers who were taking up this um, task with a politics of reclamation um, and of kind of like in, uh, kind of like reinstating marginalized voices in the in the tradition of American poetry, right? So um, Marilyn Nelson, who I mentioned before, has this essay called "Owning the Masters," where she says, um, "Start this quote starts by quoting Audre Lorde." The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, writes Audre Lorde and Sister Outsider. But why should we dismantle the house? Why don't we instead take possession of? Why don't we own the tradition? Um, and I, I do want to say, make sure to say um, before um, the end of this talk that, uh, that there's a long history of Black writers, African American writers, um, innovating within and outside of traditional forms, right? So um, this concept of taking possession of the tradition, you know, one could argue that it goes all the way back to Phyllis Wheatley. There's also, you know, there. Uh, if we think of one one form that I didn't talk about is the blues form, which you might be familiar from reading with from reading um, Langston Hughes or other Harlem Renaissance poets, and then. Uh, Throughout history, though, um, throughout the history of American poetry, um, black writers have uh, continuously invented new forms um, to take the place of and be in conversation with those traditions inherited from Europe. So things like the bop, um, which I mentioned that Lyra Van Cleef Stefanon was writing a poem that was uh, in the form of a bop. We talked about syncopated sonnets um, invented by Ty and Bajess. And then very recently, um, last year, Jericho Brown put out a book where he um, used an invented form called the duplex, which combines elements of the sonnet, the puzzle, and the blues. So um, yeah, these new traditions are being invented every day, particularly in the margins, from the margins. And then um, for, you know, just to, in the, in response to that question of like, what is the place of formalism now? Um, and like, you know, are, is, is, is formalism dead? Um, I think that an, a question in response to consider is what's the relationship between formal poetry and hip hop? You know, can we really say that formalism is a thing of the past when the most popular form of music that people listen to today is essentially metered verse? Um, so yeah, so I think that that formalism is around us, even if we aren't don't think of ourselves as as writers who are particularly influenced by it. Some essays for more reading that you can look into if you want to um, read a little bit more about some of the things that I talked about today. So there's that essay, Owning the Masters. Um, Learning the Sonnet by Rachel Richardson is a really quick and easy and accessible um, overview that's on the Poetry Foundation blog. Um, I love this essay. This It's an essay series in, in four parts um, by the poet Lorianne Guerrero um, called Stealing the Crown, which Talk, where she talks about her return to form after feeling really displaced from from it and then writing a sonnet crown um, to elegize her grandfather. Um, on Medium, there's this post called the Evolution of the Huzzle, um, which I found to be a really easy and informative read. And then if you want to know more about the New Formalist movement, um, the essay that I would recommend you reading is Notes on the New Formalism by Dana Joya, which is on the Hudson Review and available on JSTOR. Um, with the exception of that one, which you need, I mean, you'll, you have access to JSTOR, I think. So, um, but um, through that, you, all of these should be available for you to read online if you just search. So that's um, that's the overview. If you have any more questions, you can always email me. There's also, this is was just a very sh 
short sample of the many, many poetic forms that exist in the world for you to explore and experiment with. So um, I just encourage you to Google um, if none of these, uh, none of the things that I talked about really spark your interest. Um, or if you want to find out other things, then um, I encourage you to do more research. And yeah, if you have any questions, email me. And um, thanks for listening. And let's talk soon. Thanks, y'all.